this is a very unique session, very special, very needed on decolonizations. We have Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Petty from Decolonizing Architecture Research with us online here today, and also Denise Ferreira da Silva from New York University, professor from New York University and well known by also uh, all our community. And they will be responded by Hiba Boakar and Ateya uh, Korakiwala from our GSAP community and faculty. Uh, I want to say that uh, this is the, the basically the uh, this is a topic that we we uh, included in affirmation as a long time ago, and it's it was at that point as important as it, as it is now and relevant and crucial, maybe now more urgent than ever in the situation that the world is in. This is something that uh, it was already it was incredibly relevant and avoidable when we were working on uh, affirmation sessions, uh, but but now it seems equally important, but more urgent than ever. Uh, under the current circumstances. And GSAP is a school that is committed to interrogating colonization and coloniality and explore decolonization as a spatial practice and material practice. And that's why the work of Sandy and Alessandro has been a reference uh, in this building for a long time now. Uh, this is something that our faculty, students and researchers have been addressing through their work, their teaching, their research and their activism. And it's, um, it's a very important moment to reiterate the, the, the school's commitment uh, to freedom of speech and academic freedom and the capacity to have these discussions and think this through together as a school. Uh, this is something, of course, that is uh, uh, addressed in the research, scholarship, and teaching that we do, and we keep doing this during these days. And personally, I want to say that I feel that I have a very strong commitment against violence and, and uh, war. And I my feeling is that this is broadly shared by the school's faculty, students, and researchers. I'm happy that we can have these discussions here and that we can work together to probably think of possible different futures for, for our communities, for the world. Uh, this session will be introduced by Barjan Polman. Uh, and then we will, we will we will ask uh, Sandy and Alessandro to intervene, and after them Denise, uh, we will ask you to intervene, and that will follow by the uh, response uh, responses by Hiba and Ateya, and it will be open to a Q and A uh, with the entire uh, uh, audience here, but also to our planetary uh, cohort and those that are following the session online. So Parjan, please. Thank you. Um, Andres, and uh, welcome everyone to what is now the, the fifth of affirmations. Um, and as always, I want to welcome not only all of you present here in the room, but also all of you who join us remotely on GSEP's YouTube channel, in particular, the members of our planetary cohort of respondents who are joining us across many different time zones. So again, good night, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you. Um, I want to especially welcome Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Petty of DAR, Decolonizing Architecture Art Research, who are joining us remotely, as well as Denise Ferreira da Silva, who is also joining us remotely, um, and GSEP professors Atea Korakivala um, and Hiba Buakar. Um, this session was intended to be an in-person conversation, but uh, the speakers requested to be remote. Um, however, Atea and Hiba um, are joining us in person, so we have a sort of um, hybrid um, conversation. Uh, my name is Bartjan Polman. I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programming here at GSEP. Um, and it's been a few weeks since our last affirmation. So as a reminder, I want to stress once again that Affirmations is a project, a project that was developed as a series addressing urgencies through multiple lenses and voices with topics that should be understood as intersecting rather than isolated. Perhaps even more important, and as the title suggests, um, this series is meant to affirm possibilities, possibilities for ecosystems, societies, and worlds to come, discussed through the built environment and as emerging from the ruins of manifold contemporary crises. Possible futures that emerge from the cracks in the structures of powers built on the interdependency of carbonization, extractivism, colonization, racialization, anthropocentrism, inequality, patriarchy, and technocracy. Um, and with our session so far, we have seen many threats that, that weave throughout these intersecting topics um, and that no doubt will continue this evening, uh, which is urgent in so many ways. 
Um, I'll keep my remarks brief so there's all the more time for conversation because once again, um, the format of affirmations is really meant to be a conversation rather than, than a lecture or a series of lectures. Um, so we'll first have Alessandro and Sandy present for about 25 minutes, um, followed by uh, Denise. And then we'll get the initial responses uh, first from, from Hiba and then from Atea uh, before we open it up to you, um, the audience and, and the planetary cohort. And we should be done around 8, 8.15 p.m. Um, so now over to the formal introductions. Um, first, we have a presentation by Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Petty of DAR, Decolonizing Architecture Art Research. Uh, DAR, founded as Decolonizing Architecture Art uh, Residency with A.L. Weizmann in 2007, continually, continually engages uh, with a practice firmly rooted um, in research, art, pedagogy, and politics, and that, I quote, acts within and against the condition of permanent temporariness. Um, based between Beit Sahur and Stockholm, their work is strongly engaged in struggles for justice and equality. In 2013, along with Eyal Weissmann, they called for a re-examination um, of such struggles by shifting from a historical view of revolution uh, to an ongoing, ongoing decolonization perspective through their book entitled Architecture After Revolution. Um, notable projects include the reconstruction of Al Nada social housing, the creation of a concrete tent for communal use in uh, Bethlehem's refugee camp, which show a recent iteration for the Sharjah Triennial. And I know that several of you in the audience uh, were actually able to, to see it last week. Um, and the reshaping of the Shufat school layout in 2014, opening for alternative forms of pedagogies. Dar's work ex extends to ed educational initiatives like campusing camps and the three school project in Brazil, Mexico, India, Croatia, Hong Kong, Australia, further developing learning environments globally. Among the many awards received by the firm, their project Entity de Colonizzazione, uh, which focuses on the reuse of colonial fascist architecture in Borgo Rica, Sicily, uh, was awarded the Golden Lion for best participation in the most recent Venice Biennial created by Leslie Loco. Um, Denise Ferreira da Silva is the Samuel Rudin Professor in the Humanities uh, Department of Spanish and Portuguese and co-director of the Critical Racial and Anti-Colonial Study Lab um, at New York University. Um, her works, which crucially um, operates across many different disciplines, um, addresses global issues through an anti-colonial Black feminist perspective. Uh, her important and remarkable books include Towards the Global Idea of Race from 2007 and Unpayable Debt from 2022, uh, which defy, defy traditional Western frameworks and raise questions related to coloniality and the understanding of race, taking into account the global dynamics of power and oppression. As an artist, her work includes the movie Serpent Rain from 2016 and Four Waters Deep um, Implicancy from 2018, um, in collaboration with Aryuna Neumann and the studio practice Poetical Readings and Sensing Salon in collaboration with Valentina Desideri. Uh, da Silva's work engages with issues related to the politics of Nolox production and the decolonization of academia, re-evaluating existing epistemological frameworks. She has exhibited and lectured worldwide, including at the Pompidou Center, Whitechapel Gallery, Mass, Reina Sofia, um, Guggenheim, and MoMA. Um, Hiba Buakar is an associate professor in the Urban Planning Program here at Columbia GSEP. Her research focuses on planning in conflict and post-conflict cities, um, the questions of urban security and violence, um, and the role of religi religious political organizations in the making of cities. Buakar's book, um, For the War Yet to Come, Planning by Roots Frontiers, uh, Frontiers, uh, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2018, has won multiple awards, and currently she is working on a new project entitled Sedimentary Urbanization, for which she received the 2019 Rockefeller Foundation Academic Writing Fellowship. Atea Korakivala is an architectural historian and assistant professor of architecture here at Columbia University, GSEP, and her research focuses on India's development decades. The work examines the aesthetics and materiality of its post-colonial infrastructure and ecological and political landscapes. And her current book project is called Famine Landscapes and is an infrastructural and architectural history set in India's post-colonial countryside. Other research projects include the labor politics and environmental histories of architectural materials like concrete, bamboo, and plastic. Um, and with that, I would like to open the floor um, to Alessandro and Sandy. Um, maybe before uh, we begin, uh, I would like to maybe acknowledge uh, the hesitations we felt um, in engaging in this conversation tonight. Um, that's also one of the reasons why we are uh, online and not there, unfortunately. Uh, the current repression uh, in Palestine makes everything seems wrong uh, and inappropriate. However, after discussions with uh, numerous friends, 
and colleagues at Columbia, we have decided to proceed to honor the struggles of individuals and groups against occupation, colonialism, and apartheid. We find ourselves in an unprecedented assault on Palestinians marked by highly dangerous escalation led by the US government, coupled with a suppression of critical voices in Western institution in particular. Prior to, to this talk, I was advised to uh, avoid using terms such as ceasefire or peace as they are considered now controversial. The term decolonization, which is the title of tonight gathering, is even banned now on social media's platform, curricula and cultural institutions. We are entering one of the most obscure chapter of Western history. Spaces for critical conversations are closing down and we have to get prepared to build alternative platform to continue our conversations and action elsewhere. In this spirit, we extend the invitation to join architects and planners against apartheid. It is a call to avoid isolation or worse, silence and complicity in the face of the current situation. We need to move beyond statements and build new spaces for action and critical reflection. Well, indeed, uh, maybe I would like to um, put the foundation of who I am today, who is the architect in me and, and which was uh, the pillars of, of becoming architects. And, and indeed, you know, in this dark uh, time we are living, I would like to remind myself and the room is that this image in front of us, and I'm one of these people that were shouting already when I was 13 years old, and I am now 50. I was shouting when I was 13 years old during the first intifada and, and actually shouting for a, a free life, for uh, having open schools and open universities. Indeed, this was the moment where this was my maybe first understanding how important it is to still be studying, to still understand knowledge as a way of building narration, right? And in that moment, uh, when I was teenage, uh, schools and universities were completely shut down by the Israeli military uh, colonial occupation. And in that sense, I myself, I am the product of these neighborhood schools that in minutes that kind of collectivity that is what is still holding in palestine what is still holding in gaza today that kind of collectivity i saw my parents i saw my neighbors i saw everybody around me checking any living room that was empty in that moment any garage that was empty and we we organized immediately ourselves and suddenly i was studying in these neighborhood schools, knowing that only by studying as a teenage, I was breaking the rule of my occupier, right? And in that sense, this was really the first moment where I understood that I can be physically occupied, I can be physically colonized, but I still have the chance to decolonize my mind. It is during the first intifada. It is, I, I myself learned during the first intifada and during the non-violence uh, um, struggle, the, the, the Palestinian non-violence struggle, on what does it mean and how we absolutely should hold on our... Um, our right to decolonize our mind, even if our bodies are still colonized by our Israeli occupier. And in that sense, maybe another image, and, and here I'm really drawing the images that, that was at the foundation of my, of my education, right? This is another image like the one of the collectivity that I always brought with me wherever I went. And this is the first house that I witnessed being demolished. And again, I was still a, a teenager and I, in my eyes, I witness a man looking at his house, staying at the rubble of his house, thinking about 
the heritage that he is losing in there, all piece of that house, but still standing and thinking how to move forward. And in that sense, that kind of resilience stayed so strongly with, with, with me in, in also my studying architecture in Western uh, institutions. And, and here maybe, again, I would like to begin with uh, how we began to practice, right? And, and both me and Alessandro studied architecture in Venice. We uh, met there and then we decided that we would like to come and uh, practice in Palestine. And indeed, uh, you know, when we returned back, we were both at the end of our uh, PhDs and uh, we began to make questions such, what does it mean to be an architect under living under colonization and thinking, what does it mean to decolonize architecture within a context like uh, Palestine, right? And at that moment, we also began to work within refugee camps and within uh, that Palestinian resistance collectivity and insistence to actually still be um, living that life. And when we arrived to refugee camps, we realized that all our Western knowledge did not help us to understand what we were witnessing, right? I mean, in, in refugee camps, private is not private, public is not public, resilience has a complete different meaning, Neighboring is 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 an act of of resilience and solidarity. Hospitality takes a complete different uh, meaning. And indeed, in order for us to understand better, we decided to uh, establish a university in a refugee camp. And that university was actually an attempt to build a collective dictionary. And in, in that sense, we were very much thinking what, what a life that is made of a permanent temporariness made of. What does it mean to stay, to be in a place still belonging somewhere else? What does it mean to belong to more than one place simultaneously? And indeed, while working with refugees, they challenged us and says, you know, but you are architects, right? I mean, what would be? A, un a building for a university in a refugee camp? And what would be a classroom of a refugee, of, of, of a university in a classroom? And at that moment, the, the answer was a concrete tent, because a concrete tent is a university that is making questions rather than giving answers. A concrete tent, why concrete tent? What does it mean to live in a permanent temporariness? And, and, that, and all these questions that we had inside that concrete tent was uh, in some way, maybe the base through which uh, we then uh, began to think, what are the values? What are the ways we can understand heritage and collectivity in, in um, refugee camps? And in that sense, what, what I would like to move through is like, you know, we began to work and understand refugee camps beyond uh, the only the, the, the part of it being victimhood and misery. We began to understand refuge as a very important heritage. If today, as Palestinians, they would ask us to list what would be the most important heritage that we carry, we would absolutely answer refugee camps and exile. I mean, this is what we have been into in the last 70 years of our history. And yet this is not inscribed in any, because, because heritage is only preserved by nation states, this is where we began to think how, what kind of projects can still be giving that value to refugee uh, camps. And, and here we will show you the Refugee Heritage Project. Do refugee camps have history? This was the fundamental question at the base of the nomination of the Haitian refugee camp as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Refugee camps are established with the intention of being demolished. They are not accepted to have a history or a future. They are meant to be forgotten.
The history of refugee camps is constantly erased, dismissed by states, humanitarian organizations, international agencies, and even by refugee community themselves in fear that any acknowledgement of the present undermines their right of return. The only history, in fact, that is recognized within refugee communities is one of violence, suffering, and humiliation. How then we understand the life and the culture that people built in camps, despite suffering and marginalization? The photos that you see here are part of the UNESCO dossier produced in over two years of discussions with refugee communities, local residents, heritage experts and cultural producers. Members of the camp strongly expressed their fear that the nomination would change the status quo and threaten to undermine the legally recognized right of return. At the same time, many expressed their desire to see refugee history being acknowledged and attempt to bring back the right of return at the center of the political discussion. We were interested here in documenting the life, the spaces, and the political structures that emerge in almost seven decades of exile. Palestinian camps are not made any more of tents, they are complex urban structure, and we don't have the right vocabulary to understand and describe this forced condition of permanent temporariness. In understanding today's refugee condition beyond the humanitarian crisis, refugee heritage traces, documents, reveals, and represent refugee history beyond the narrative of suffering and displacement. خلدة قطرة التينة القسطينة تل الترمس الفالوجة عراق المنشية القبيبة الدوايمة بيت جبرين بيت نتيف علار خربة التنور راس أبو عمار القبو بيت عطاب سفلة بيت محسير الشوع عسلين صرعة عرطوف دير رفات دير الهوى لفتة دير ياسين عين كارم المالحة سطاف صوبة خربة اللوز كسلة دير عبان الجورة زكريا البريج كدنا ذكرين دير الدبان دير الشيخ جرش مغلس عجور الولج These are the names of the villages of origin of which Palestinians were expelled and now reside in the Hesha refugee camp. Israel demolished more than 300 villages in 1948 in order to prevent Palestinians from returning to their homes. Today, only a few public buildings like schools, mosques and cemeteries 
are standing as material evidence to the expulsion of the Palestinians. Today, these villages have for the most part been substituted with exclusive Jewish-Israeli towns, national parks and industrial areas. Refugee camps and villages of origin are associated with the same history of displacement and disposition. They are both in legal limbo and suspended. On the one hand, the camp is a permanent temporary space of emergency carved out of the state sovereignty. While on the other hand, the village is legally defined by the Israeli state as absentee property. Despite their geographical separations, the two sides clearly have direct links and connections. Therefore, we see the possibility and the urgency of nominating the Haitia refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin as a serial transboundary World Heritage Site according to the UNESCO World Heritage Site criteria. And indeed, we have been, I have to say, we have been obsessed with understanding what kind of heritage we can still be uh, indeed uh, thinking of by not, because, because the main problem of what we uh, really face is that we dismiss that life in exile and, and we dismiss that buildings that are now becoming rubbles. And, and I think that if we have a task today as uh, architects and planners is to understand how not to dismiss that history. That history is a history of resilience, is a history of rebels, yet it is to be narrated, it needs to be narrated, and it would be a double nakba if we will accept that we will ourselves dismiss that history. And indeed, with all what we learned from Palestine, I have to say, we return back to Italy and to Europe in, in particular to understand what does it mean learning from Palestine? What does it mean for us to decolonize Europe or to begin to think what does it mean today if Palestinian decolonization is by facing the Israeli military uh, occupation? What does it mean today to decolonize in Europe and what kind of projects that we can eventually be uh, engaged with? In 1940, the Italian fascist regime established the entity of colonization of Sicilian latifundium following the model of the entity of colonization of Libya and colonial architecture in Eritrea and Ethiopia. These territories were considered by the regime empty, underdeveloped and backward, and therefore it needed to be reclaimed modernized and repopulated. For this purpose, the entity of colonization inaugurated eight new rural towns in Sicily and as many remained unfinished. Today, most of these villages have fallen into ruin. However, what does not seem to be in ruin is the persistence of fascist, colonial and modernist rhetoric, culture, and politics. Despite the fall of fascism following the Second World War, Europe defascistizations unfortunately remains an unfinished process. This is one of the reasons why there are so many visible architectures and monuments that celebrate fascist regime. Moreover, having lost its colonies during the Second World War, some European countries have never embarked in a real process of decolonization. With the reemergence of fascist ideologies in Europe, 
it becomes urgent to ask, what kind of heritage is the fascist colonial and modernist heritage? And who has the right to reuse it? Should this heritage simply be demolished or could be reoriented towards other ends? The European colonial model project of exploitation, segregation and dispossessions has divided the world into races and nations constructing its own identity in opposition to other projects, labels simply as traditional or backward. The suppression of alternative was and still is an attempt to create a singular modernist colonial epistemology. Therefore, modernity cannot exist without the disqualification and degradation of other approaches and worldviews. In 2017, the nomination of Asmara, the capital of Eritrea, as UNESCO World Heritage Site for its modernist colonial architecture built by the fascist regime during the Italian occupation posed a series of fundamental questions for both the ex-colonized and the ex-colonizer. Who has the right to preserve, reuse, and re-narrate fascist colonial and modernist architecture? While architecture modernism in particular continues to be celebrated for its progressive social and political agenda, what the modernist rhetoric of progress and innovation obscure is its dark side, namely its inherent homogenizing authoritarian and segregational dimensions. These modernist conceptions are still present in contemporary architecture and urban planning, where in the name of modern architecture, entire communities, form of living and historical sites are simply erased. While a critique of modernism alone is not enough, having already been conducted by postmodernism, the task of the present is additionally to imagine architectural forms of demodernization. Demodernization indeed does not mean opposing the use of electricity and wiring, mortar and beams, or technology or infrastructure. Instead, it means profaning the separations disconnections and isolations embodied by architectural modernism. By opposing modernity aggressive universalism, demodernization is a method of desegregation that applies as both discourse and praxis to in invent form of reappropriation and reuse of modern architecture. In recent years, the right-wing Sicilian regional government in an effort to re-legitimize fascist policies, decided to fund architectural architecture, uh, conservation of the agricultural towns built by the entity of colonization of Sicilian Latifundium, restoring them as they were originally built. Against this nostalgic approach, in Borgorizza, in Sicily, we collaborated with the municipality of Carlentini, the local community and university to establish a difficult heritage summer school a space for critical pedagogy and discussions around practices of reappropriation and re-narration. Over the years, we started to discuss with the local municipality how to turn the former entity of colonization of Sicilian Latifundio in Borgorizza into an entity of decolonization. This collective process has been open to all of those who felt the urgency to question the broader historical, cultural, and political heritage embedded in colonialism, fascism, and modernism, and therefore begin a path towards new practices of decolonization and demodernization. In addition to the commitment in Borgorizza, we felt the need to take the conversation in other, in other context, to expand the possibility of learning from different places and build new alliances. The artistic installation, Ente di Decolonizzazione, profaned the entity of colonization of Sicilian Latifundio in Sicily, breaking down and recomposing its facade into several modular seats. These are reused as a platform for an open discursive space where the public is invited to critically reconsider 
the social and political and economic effects of fascism and colonialism. Colonial modernist architecture, both in the former colonies and in colonizing countries, have been built as isolated and sacred objects to be admired. Therefore, for us, is not enough simply to reuse them in the same way previous regimes have used them, nor simply to demolish them. They need to be profaned. They need to be used against themselves and open for new common uses different from what the, those they were designed for. Giorgio Agamben proposed the idea of profanation as a strategy for returning things to their common uses. Profaning does not simply mean abolishing or canceling separations, but learning to make new uses of them. To profane is to transgress the dividing line, to use it in particular ways. Decolonizing architecture, therefore, could be understood as an act of profanation, which does, displace which does not simply displace power, but using its destructive potential to reverse its functioning and subvert its uses. In May 2006, the Israeli army evacuated the military camp strategically located on the highest hill at the southern entrance of um, Beit Sahur in Bethlehem. It was built as a military base by the British Mandatory Army, and after 1948, it became a military base of the Jordan uh, Legion, and in 1976, became an Israeli military base. The most controversial part of the site is the top of the hill. There, several concrete buildings from the heart of the former camp, surrounded by a giant mound of earth, that runs along the top of the edge of the hill. The hill, in Arabic, in Arabic it's called Oshograb, the crow nest. In the days immediately following its evacuation, Palestinians entered the military base and took away any elements and materials that could be recycled. At this time, there were some people who demanded that the military base continue to be used as a military base for Palestinians while all the others knew that it was necessary to change its function and its, its military uh, function uh, was not to continue. For a few months, the military base worked for the ex-prisoner as a device to tell the story of violence and torture that the ex-prisoner had suffered in the military base. Israeli settlers with military protection reoccupied the military base with intention to transforming into a new settlement. But we didn't give up, and we took possession of the military base again. But they come back, and after a few weeks, but also we come back. We staged a series of events which disoriented the Israeli soldiers who were expecting violent demonstrations. Simultaneously with this series of actions, Imad al director of the Palestinian Wildlife Society, jumped on one of the military towers from which soldiers were shooting at the Palestinian and used the tower exactly against himself, profaning its function, turning into a bird watching point. The military tower that once functioned as a panopticon to control the Palestinian population, it was reused by Imad as an observatory for plants and bird migration. Imad explained to us that thousands of migratory birds can be seen stopping in Oshograb every spring and fall. There are approximately 520 bird species and 2,700 plant species found in this area. So it is considered an important base for migratory birds using the Jordan Valley Jericho routes and the Jerusalem mountains. The path of the birds migrating from Siberia to Southern Africa converge on Palestine. The flocks tend to nest on hills of Palestine, such as Oshugrab. One day, Imad, irritated, asked, you are architects, aren't you? So instead of wasting time planting tree, walking people around, organizing demonstration, why not to produce an architectural design for Oshugrab? By accepting his challenge, our proposal for the reuse of the site 
become an intervention in the political struggle for the hill. Because of its revolving door occupation, it became fundamental to make the buildings inhospitable to human activity. So rather than renovating and converting the base to give it another function, the intention was to increase the process of its destruction and disintegration. In this way, the project became a project of obsolescence, where the top of the hill with its military barracks is no longer used by men, but instead is returned to nature. Our colleagues at the Palestinian Wildlife Society expected the birds to come and inhabit these holes turning ocean grub into a large bird nest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, hi everybody. Um, uh, I would like to thank um, Andres and Barjan and everyone at um, G, I still don't know how to say it, ZAP, ZAP for uh, the invitation to be in conversation with Sandy and, um, and Alessandro. Um, yes, when we would, yeah, when I was invited, I had something in mind that, uh, you know, I could talk about in, in, you know, in very direct conversation with um, the work you, you have been doing. And thank you for the work you do. <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I forgot to say that. Um, but um, but I, I'm feeling inadequate like, like everybody else in this, in this impossible moment. And, uh, and both of you spoke very directly and effectively to why anything that we do, everything that we do as usual is, um, yeah, it, it's not, it's, uh, it, it's unqualifiable, right? Because um, it pales in face of, of so much horror, so much violence that, that people uh, are facing in Gaza and in other parts of Palestine um, in, this, in this moment. So I, so I am going to talk about decolonization, but it's going to come from some place other than the way, you know, than directly. Um, but more, maybe more, um, more directly, I, I could say that um, I'm going to elaborate on something that it is, that, you know, I, I treat not, not very um, explicitly sometimes or not very, and I don't take so much time. I treat. I'm referring to when I when I when I talk about decolonization as as the return of the total value expropriated and extracted from native lands and uh, enslaved bodies under conditions of total violence. And it is also impl implicit in 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 the notion, the understanding of coloniality that it's in my work, which is um, as a which is a modality of government that relies primarily on the threat and deployment of, of total violence. But I'm not going to talk about those things because I have been arrested by, by the present and I cannot but uh, speak to, to this moment. So I, I wrote this you know, short presentation which has the title um, beyond good and evil, a draft pro proposition for a dreadful occasion. Um, and well, I'm going to share with you. I think it speaks to so much, so pretty much everything that you have presented, but in a very indirect way. So let's see what uh, how the questions will, will bring us together. But this is a um, this is a this is an offering, of, you know, um, to all of us. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, earlier this year um, in Paris, where I lived from early February through mid-June, almost every week, tens of thousands of workers, students, academics marched along major avenues against protesting uh, Emmanuel Macron's bill that increased the retirement age, uh, also protesting against France police 
and the whole range of neoliberal reforms that have been destroying workers' rights, but also social rights in general in France and elsewhere. French workers and youth um, who protested and were confronted by the police, however, did not convince French politicians to vote against Macron's bill to protect uh, that one labor right. Their demand went unheard because it seems that elected representatives, including the president against whom they were protesting, that elected representatives were, were oblivious to their demand for protection, uh, to their expression of, of the coll collective will. Um, by the end of May, um, we had to acknowledge that 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 unique that that unique uh, industrial action, a rebellion that brought the old and the young, the white, white, brown, black, LGBTQ, I plus, cis women, men, workers, students, academics, undocumented and documented migrants, artists, and so many to the streets of Paris, um, and everybody at some point singing, everyone detests the police. Well, that that rebellion against the new liberal state. It, it had been defeated. Uh, move all the way to last Wednesday evening uh, at here in New York at Washington Square Park, a group of Palestinian and other mostly BIPOC young protesters, probably students, were demanding ceasefire and they were being confronted by pro-Israel protesters. A few NYU security and NYPD police officers separated, you know, stood between the two of them. At first, that scene seemed like a perfect staging of democracy, maybe even different, you know, the opposite to the French one. Uh, at first, until when, you know, you notice the line uh, of police officers who are there with the presumed mandate for preserving public order. And that made it impossible not to compare that scene of Wednesday with the one I saw in, in which I participated in Paris um, throughout the, the first half of this year. As I watched the scene unfolding in Washington Square Park, uh, it was not, it was impossible not to see it as, as a rehearsal of that defeat that I experienced with, in May. But now the defeat is not here, it's not so much about losing a battle, but about losing the battle ground, the political stage. Because the streets, the, the utmost uh, stage for radical polit political events, for expressions of dissatisfaction with the liberal uh, institutions. But in, in New York City, in the New York City scene, that scene, our moment now, the street has been turned into a moral stage, which is signaled by the enforcing line of uh, police officers um, and, they were, and with the task of uh, preserving the integrity of the public space or, or, or of the public body, however we, or territory, however we wanna talk about it. So by defeat, I mean that, that when the moral, uh, the moral ethic replaces the civil, the juridic, in the scene of confrontation. In this case, you know, the taking to the streets, um, that's the scene of confrontation. Uh, and we know that taking to, it to the streets is, where, is what we do when all democratic mechanisms fail or seem to be failing, or we know that it, they are not going to work. So we take it to the streets. But, but, but in this moment, that that stage uh, has been depoliticized uh, because what we have as um, really is an, this, uh, the actual or potential criminalization of protests, which immediately turns the police, the tool of the repressive state, into the protective authority for everybody else, not for those who are protesting. And here really it doesn't matter whether or not the state uses or threatens the use of, of lethal force or threatens uh, deployment of total violence. What matters is that this shift dissolves rebellion 
uh, they, because the streets, once stripped of, of you know, its, its political significance, it turns into that impersonal liminal space where, uh, you know, criminality abounds, um, they say. So, and, and, and of course the case here, because I don't make it very explicit in the, in the, in the draft proposition, but the case here is precisely one one about taking criminality as a political signifier, as a as a political tactic, and not to you know leave it out there in that in that moral moral context. But we can talk about about that later. Um, so these two scenes I find speak directly to what is perhaps the most important thing we face as critical scholars and practitioners and and teachers. But I'm speaking primarily to the critical scholars and and teachers. Um, to us, the crucial challenge in this moment is also the most important mandate, which is to articulate critical statements which are not arrested by the governing simplifying discourse that immediately turns every exchange into a sequence of postings, postings in, 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 in social media feeds. Here I find is precisely an instance, um, you know, and then it towards you know, contributing for for this you know for doing that critical work. Um, I'm I'm proposing to read this this moment of this movement towards criminalization. This and and the, the and the choreography that that is in there as as an instance of activation of a key component of what I call the liberal political architecture, which is the colonial racial cis hetero patriarchal matrix. That matrix, uh, it, you know, it's the entrails of the liberal formation. Um, it, it hosts a formative, um, uh, I call it infrastructural element called, which is authority. And authority actually operates in and through the celebrated principles, uh, liberty and equality, and a principle that is not usually activated, which is integrity. So, um, Working that way, uh, authority is constitutive of the liberal political subject, be that the citizen or the state. And an important aspect of that of authority is that in being constitutive of the liberal political subject, it is not extended to those over which it is exercised. That is, those under colonial, racial, cis patriarchal uh, subjugation. Uh, those don't never never claim, can never claim authority. But still the critical text, right? The, 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 the tools, the critical tools we have in, in our hands, which, which have been so precise in terms of identifying and challenging the operations of these various components of the, the matrix, the critical text consistently misses authority precisely because of the focus is on the infrastructural level, we you know that is uh, I call the molecular level, um, and that which which is on, on that which allows only allows for subjugation to be described in terms of hierarchy and inequality, uh, subjugation you know under the within the liberal formation, and I think more importantly because authority enters in the composition of the liberal political subject. That is, it is its constitutive matter. It is always presupposed and never subjected to philosophical elaborations and uh, or you know critical theoretical excavations. And for this reason, it operates unchecked infrastructurally throughout the liberal architecture, which means that it has been cultivated, rehearsed and manifested at the level of the sensibility and not, but it's not being formed, theorized and experienced, uh, you know, at, at the level of subjectivity, which is a distinction that is small, but, but important. So by this, I mean that, that authority operates in as, as, as the matter that composes the liberal stage and not in what is formed or, or in that which is staged or in the various scenes performed in the liberal stage. As such, the sensibility, um, sorry. So, 
so this 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 lack of attention to to authority then is 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 important because it escapes the formalizations that we deploy in 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 our critical in our critical work so for instance um when when considering the the state uh, we we there is a there, there has been a focus on legitimacy but not on on what it bases its authority and and why well um we know that both le legitimacy and authority, in a way, also refer to what you know was once called by um, the cultural or the ideological level, or which I call the ethic and the symbolic level. But they are different in that legitimacy recalls the political context that's been designed by Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment philosophers, which were the limiting, you know, establishing that which is distinctive uh, of the modern itself. And as such, what is and what's not legitimate has been formed and transformed in the operations of the ethic and symbolic moments of, you know, in, 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 in post-enlightenment political discourse. Now, authority, on the other hand, also refers to the ethic and the symbolic, but it, but of that as guided by the divine, the image, uh, the figure of the divine author and ruler. So I such it is not so much a creation of modern philosophy, but it's a kind of raw material that has that it's being used in the very designing of, of, of the liberal formation. And and that and it and it operates as raw material, like as a as an elemental aspect, precisely because the obedience to the divine law of self-preservation is uh, what is at the basis of the justification for the building of modern juridical forms such as the state and, and the law. Um, and, then, and then of course, you know, the, that, that raw material has remained in modern philo philosophical and political discourse while the divine has been demoted to the cultural or to the religious or, and, and those other aspects. Anyway, so it's not surprising then that authority figures in the classic modern philosophical texts in the, in, in, but uh, in the figure of the patriarch, right? The patriarch that transmutes into the political subject. Uh, which is you not know, the basic juridic and, and economic uh, entity. And following the mandate for self-preservation, the patriarch relinquished part of its liberty and part of its authority um, to a higher form of the state and the constitution in order to protect the, their integrity, whether the integrity of their body, but also, uh, also to protect um, the the. the, the Property. So no longer a divine law in modern political texts, the mandate for self-preservation, which you know, stays under uh, the name of natural law, is attributed to the citizenry, the body politic, and the state as the precondition for all other, or for any other rights. As the point of departure or the arc form of the modern subject, it is more immediately recalled by the principle of integrity. Uh, the preservation of which is a task beyond the scrutiny of the modern juridical apparatus. So the notion of Jews necessitatis, uh, which is a notion of self-preservation as a reason for committing an otherwise, uh, you know, something that, an act that would otherwise be considered criminal. Um, so that Jews necessitatis refers primarily to, to, to the claim to, to self-preservation. And before the claim to self-preservation, the claims to liberty and equality, they, they, they collapse. Um, and it is self-preservation that carries uh, authority into the modern political framework uh, in connection with um, the concept of, of integrity. But of course, unless the claim to self-preservation is made by those who in the political, the liberal political architecture only exist as subjects under colonial, racial, and cis heteropatriarchal subjugation. Uh, why? Well, because the mandate for self-preservation or the protection of integrity does not doesn't apply to them, as we can see articulated in the very descriptions of um, of the the the, the, the 
Oh, anyway, this will have, I'm not, I'm not going to, to cover that. Uh, the second, because I can elaborate it later. So the second, um, liberty and equality as principles are contingent upon the modern political subjects inherent claims to integrity or authority to uh, preserve its body and, and, and integrity. Um, okay. So what I'm highlighting here is precisely that aspect of the modern liberal political entity that is articulated in claims for the necessity or the obligation to preserve the integrity of the political body territory. In the case, you know, in the case, and in the case of the citizens, it includes uh, their, their own body, he, you know, or the citizen, his own body and his, his household, you know, thinking of the, the classical political philosophical text. So as I, as I have argued uh, elsewhere for the past 150 years or so, raciality has played a crucial role in support of deployment of total violence justified as necessary for self-preservation of integrity of an individual as, the, as well as a collective body, whether it's racial, national purity, identity, uh, territory, as public safety or security. Not surprisingly right now, raciality is again playing this role um, in support of otherwise unacceptable deployment of total violence uh, by by Israel, but it does so, but it, it does so through uh, criminalization also, not only but also. The perverse irony cannot go and um, this perverse irony cannot go unnoticed that many of those being criminalized are living under colonial domination and or are those whose work academic and artistic, confront colonial and racial subjugation. So, but, but what is this proposition, this proposition that I hope is in conversation with the, uh, Sandy and Alexand Alessandro's work, and then I also hope uh, contributes to opening up a space for us to continue our critiques of the global present, in particular of the operations of raciality, uh, and also critique of this reemergence of fascism, which now comes up against gains, you know, in terms of racial and gender and sexual rights. Um, but, but, but critiques that are not immediately caught in the prevailing simplifying moralistic take on the operations of racial, which usually stop at the accusation of racism that basically boil down to the identification of what's done as discrimination, of what's said, as being about using old stereotypes. And I'm not saying that focusing on stereotyping and, and also a discrimination and dehuman, dehumanization is not what we should not do it. And I'm not saying that it's not relevant. I'm just saying that stop at the moment of diagnosing them, which is what we have been doing in our critical uh, work. Um, it's not enough. Uh, because they keep working against us in so many different unexpected ways. So, and the problem is why? Because the because social accusations, including the, the accusation of of racism, they apply a, they apply a moral design to the civil space. And I, and by that I mean that in the so in the case of the shifting scene that I mentioned uh, earlier, the taking of streets, which has been an expression of citizens dissatisfaction with the state has become uh, redefined as criminal. And the point is that but the criminal um, as a, a, is, a model, is a model signified which uh, quite immediately allows for by, the bypassing of reflection, right? Uh, as, as it is expressed in the kind of simplified uh, mannequin uh, discursive deadlock in which we are caught. Uh, right now. Now, the use of criminalization as a tactic against protests have been going on for a, for a while, for a long time. Um, but the most recently, we can come back to the Battle of Seattle in 1999. And then I was in the UK during the protests against James Cameron's cuts on social spending. Uh, criminalization was there in the choreography of Kathleen. Um, in Rio de Janeiro in, to, uh, in 2013, and then in Brazil, in various parts of Brazil in 2016. And then, of course, in Paris earlier this, this, this year. 
what we find in, in all these cases is that when, when in the place of protest, in face of protest, the state unleashes the police to ensure public safety or security or, or to pro protect private property, we, in, the, in those moments, we are dealing with the state deployment of criminality as a political strategy. But it happens very quickly, right? Um, because the collapse, the collapsing of rights uh, happens immediately in the very threat and use of, uh, in that the threat and use of, of uh, lethal force becomes possible, it, it's happening. Um, but anyway, at Washington Square Park, or, you know, what I, I called uh, defeat was nothing more than the crowning of criminality. Because in that scene, what was figured is precisely, it, uh, criminality was figured precisely because the confrontation did not involve uh, the police and the protesters, but the confrontation was between the two groups. So what we had there was this logic of war um, and, and or, or, or the logic of enmity. Um, and an important aspect of this, this moment I find is that this logic of war of, of attribution of en enmity to the social subaltern, like the racial, gender, sexual, uh, sexual subjugated, that attribution manifests among the populace in familiar fascistic manners. And in a familiar fascistic manner, one in which the side are going to be under attack, undermined, or violated, and key here is, is integrity, that side seeks to control, take control of the narrative, the high moral ground, and or of, of the state. So um, yeah, the key challenge in this moment is to dislodge the logic of war and the discourse on enmity and criminality, and try and grasp how how this 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 moment is attending to the needs of of global state capital and also what those needs are. Uh, so I find I think that we we need to shift the logic and instead of remaining within the oppositional setup uh, of confrontation uh, of confrontation and this requires that we attend to the triangle and see how the presence of of the police renders the scene one of criminality of course. Um, but then, but it's not, uh, I should say, a move towards finding a, another general category which would name a new universal proper subject, uh, you know, like that plays the role that the proletariat plays in, in Marx's critique of capital. Because criminality does not affect all in the same way. So no matter how black the world appears to have become, um, criminality and the use of total violence um, such attributions of support consistently attaches to the currently and former colonized and to the currently racially subjugated persons and populations, as well as to those who go against that which this, that which cis heteropatriarchy establishes as proper expressions. In Paris, in direct confrontations with the protesters, the police reserved especially aggressive and humiliating actions to the brown and black French youth in the same way that the prevailing discourse is now one that only accepts attribution of criminality, of evil and becoming dangerous extensions, ideas and actions to those calling for a ceasefire. Anyway, I know it feels like we, we can't breathe. It's still for those, those who will survive, we need to create a kind, the kind of critical intellect, intellectual space that will allow us all to survive psychically and to thrive politically as we navigate against these authoritarian winds. So we need to go back to the treasure, treasure chest and gather the tools that will allow us to redesign the streets as, and to retake the streets as the locus of for rebellion. Um, thank you. Hi, thank you so much, um, Alessandro and Sandy and Denise for wonderful talks. So uh, like it is a difficult moment for you, it's a difficult moment for, for people who are on this campus to speak up against the violence that's happening in Palestine and Gaza. Uh, this is a, uh, and being a, an, a person who's employed in, in this system makes it even double hard, uh, hard in, in many, many ways. And uh, in some ways, yes, we need to redesign the streets, as Denise said, to create conversations. At the other time, it feels like every day is a battle line. Every day is a day for just figuring out 
how you're gonna find space, how you're gonna talk to people, how you're gonna see a ceasefire. Like how is it that I, as a person who grew up in war, I don't understand how something like ceasefire is something controversial, how, how 13,000 people is not possibly a genocide, uh, how is it that 5,000 children are dead is not something that we can speak about freely, that we don't have the academic freedom to talk about this. Uh, I, as a person who is now for the first time experiencing this, I wasn't here after September 11, I don't understand how can we function in such a system where every day is a battle just to speak up for the atrocities that are happening in the world. Having said that, I have a, I, I, I'm just for the, in the interest of time, I have two questions, one question for uh, Dar and one for Diniz. Um, so in the tension between uh, architecture and temporariness, architecture, especially the way we teach it, it's about building and continuously like making things and creating spaces. So between the tension, in the tension between architecture and temporariness, between living life and keeping the right to return alive for refugees, where does decolonization live? And what are the philosophies of decolonization behind your work? How do we think about decolonization at this moment when it's okay to mention decolonization when we're talking about, uh, about certain spaces and certain people because somehow we made that journey, but decolonizing, decolonization becomes criminalized when we're talking about brown folks and black folks. And it, it's like, where, how, where, where do we locate decolonization and where do you locate decolonization in your own work? Uh, and if possible, I would like you to extend that philosophy to Gaza city that has been flattened. We've seen north, north of the Gaza Strip has completely flattened. What would architecture of decolonization look like in the context of extreme cruelty and in the case of herbicide, where the intention is not only of killing people, but also the killing of the spaces of the people to stop the possibility of living and recreation, and the, the, the basically the killing of the communities that inhabit these spaces. Where does decolonization make room here? What does it mean for architecture and architecture practice when you see that, that much of destruction, given that it's about focus so much about construction, right? And it's different in your practice. So how do you locate that? And should I uh, also give um, the second question to you? Let's start maybe with this one, and then yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. go to the other one. Yeah, yeah thank you, Hiba, for... Um, um, for these comments and questions. Um, I would like to try to, uh, not to respond, maybe we think a little bit with you um, and also maybe posing, uh, uh, building on what you were asking also, maybe um, continue asking some, uh, another question too. So uh, maybe one is also, uh, a question that I have uh, following also what Denise uh, was referring to um, as also the, the street as a side um, of protest, conflict and, and political agency. Uh, and following that, I'm also wondering um, what is the campus? Um, maybe the campus is not a street. Uh, and which way, therefore, um, a campus um, at this time maybe uh, could be transformed into something else, needs to be transformed into something else, or uh, the campus remain a little bit, uh, as the origin of the word suggests, which is a camp, uh, which is a, a kind of extraterritorial space, um, separated from the rest of the city. So maybe I have a little bit also a kind of question myself following uh, Denise and, and Hiba, um, trying to collapse a little bit, uh, both the theoretical and the practical understanding, uh, because this is what is ahead of some of us, especially some of you that are in this moment living in the States, understanding, um, what is the political architectural space of, of the campus and what is uh, possible and what is not possible uh, at this time um, uh, to think there. Uh, so it's a little bit maybe also a kind of um, questions that also I would like to put a little bit for, for everyone. Um, regarding Hiba's questions around, um, let's say decolonizations and, and returns, 
as an act of, de of, of decolonization in, in our work um, has been always incredibly important to think um, um, returns, and I use the, the, the plural um, and not the singular, um, as an act of, of decolonization. And today the impossibility of a legally, internationally recognized right of return of the Palestinian, the possibility to, to think is also says a lot about the lack of political imaginations. Um, because returns would mean um, also reimagining entirely the possibility of inhabiting more than one space at the same time. And I think our incapacity to, uh, uh, to, to understand the return, which is um, not an idea simply uh, locked in a nation state um, that is pretty evident that failed and it continued to fail to solve anything. And instead of continuing to failing, you know, trying to uh, put things back, all these fragments and ruin and things back into this box that in a way it doesn't work. And instead of doing that, and that I think is also our task as um, intellectuals, our, our cultural producer, is to reopen our political imagination in which returns will allow people to live in more than one place at the same time. In our conversations, many times in refugee camps, imagining returns would also mean um, how your life, uh, it not only going back in the place of origin, that of course is not anymore, you know, what was uh, more than 70 years ago, but is also how the heritage in the camp and the space of the camp itself is actually part of that return. Because if we are not able also to imagine the return in that way, we are failing in, in, in uh, somehow uh, going beyond, beyond uh, the nation state. So in that's to me, the uh, um, declining several form of returns would mean definitely moving forward uh, a practice of, of, of decolonization. These are incredibly connected. Uh, and lastly, just very quickly, in relation to, let's say, to, to the destructions, you know, of the destruction, of the destruction, of the destructions, only our uh, project in the north of Gaza, uh, a social housing project for 300 families. These were families that were already uh, displaced four times, four times. And uh, one week ago, uh, all the buildings have been demolished once again, uh, and we lost contacts with them. So this is where what you are confronted. Uh, and this is why the violence of, of selecting a date, a moment in history, that is another thing that we have to challenge as a colonial frame. We, that should not, cannot be acceptable yes. if one look at the history. Uh, and the layer of events, even in one single family. Uh, and that is what is um, for us overwhelming um, because we worked with people that were already traumatized by generations that were, that were refugees you know, for, uh, uh, for so many times already. And one cannot even imagine you know, what does it mean once again, you know, uh, being uh, reduced to rubbles again and again. Yeah, and, and maybe if, if I uh, can add, Hippa, I think that the Gaza, uh, what is going on, what is happening now in front of our eyes, the genocide that we are witnessing, is making me think that, you know, up to today, it, it feels like it's possible to speak about decolonization in the past, and it's possible to speak about decolonization in the future, but we do not know how to speak about decolonization in the present. And in that sense, 
I think it's extremely important to understand that we can speak about decolonization only if we own the narration and, and owning the narration means beginning not, not only to, to think architecture, but, but to think Gaza in a complete bigger way, to think Gaza as part of a way bigger environment around which people in Gaza do belong do not only belong to Gaza. I mean, Gaza is made of 80% of refugees that came from many other places. And if we have to rebuild Gaza, it's extremely important to understand what does we what is it that we are building? Because everybody would like us architects to rebuild Gaza as it was before. And I think this is the task where the, the decolonization, to think decolonization in Gaza is to refuse to yeah. rebuild Gaza in the same way, is to think Gaza as, as, a, as a place from where we can imagine the world. This is the minimum that we can do in order to respond to such genocide, right? And in, in that sense, I think we are not, unfortunately, we are not equipped, yet that does not mean that we don't we don't have means to do it. And and unfortunately, I don't think that Western education that has been taught to the rest of the world, because it's not only in Colombia that architecture is taught this way, but also in Birzeit University, in in Beirut, in in all the rest of the world, we are studying architecture in the same way. So we lack knowledge, we lack capacities, and therefore I think we have to create coalition between so many people of us understanding, you know, it's only 20 years ago we began the struggle, you know, only to link architecture and politics fell 20 years ago as a struggle, right? So I think we we went quite uh, ahead in the way, but I don't believe that today, even if we are speaking about decolonization in uh, in the faculties of architecture, we are unable to speak about a present decolonization, and we should take this into uh, account and consideration. Yes, uh, amazing answers. I mean, I, I have so many thoughts. I, I will just mention a few because in the interest of time and to, to keep time for Atiyah, but uh, one of the interesting things when you're talking about campus, I was hearing, you know, how they to do tours of campus for like potentially future students with their families and stuff. And they were talking about how 116, which is the street that crossed, the person was telling, the student was telling the visitors that the campus at some point got, author, uh, the, uh, got uh, the authority to close the street, 116th Street. And so 116th Street became part of the campus. And right now, this is where they put the, the checkpoints with every protest they have it's this the street was eaten by university and so the public space that was supposed part of the city was at some point became a privatized to the to the university itself and so this is making me think also how do you want to like how even the street in some ways even the public here is under the police under the certain kind of state and if the state is the oppressor or is supporting the oppressor or funding wars then you actually the street you cannot own the street so it's very hard to even the create a battle for the street. And like Denise was said, is that one of the things that's happening is the losing the battlefield itself is that every day we have to, I mean, we've been in organizing meeting together for the past several days, is that reinvent the space where you can actually have a battlefield for at least intellectual ideas and make room for, for that. So this is one thing. So thank you so much for your thoughts. And uh, my question to Denise is a little bit of a long question, but I'll try to divide in two parts. So in one of your essays, I was trying, I was familiarizing myself with your amazing work. In one of your essays, you talk about how the performers you encounter, uh, encountered in Black Brazil return blackness to the scene of subjugation, where killing is always more than a possibility, not to reveal its truth, but to render the depths of its re refusal and fugitivity. Uh, by like the artists, the artists do that by concealing their bodies or making interventions that are unintelligible to the dominant racial viewer or consumer. This made me think basically about the extreme nakedness that we're seeing today by the Palestinians that have to show every day to us on the screens 24 seven, their amputated bodies, their dead children, their plight to the world. Like they have to be very visible. They have to be friends, transparent. They have to, sh to show like the most inner feelings to the world. So to be able to cultivate at the bare minimum, the possibility to be seen as human. So, 
given that, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the subaltern oscillation, oscillation between the politics of visibility and nakedness and the world asking them to do that just to see them as a human and the politics of refusal in the colonial practice. So this is my first part. And the second part is, do actually the subalterns have the luxury of refusal? And for example, what would have happened if this lecture we are in today did not place, take place as politics of refusal against the machine of active, active invisibilization that basically wants to obscure the subaltern to, run them in, to, run them, to render them inhuman every day and thus killable? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Hiba, and uh, I will probably ask you to ask the second question later because I have no memory. <laughs> I am, yes, I'm totally, I'm totally gone. Um, and then I'm going to start with um, Alessandro's uh, comment question about the campus. I mean, you, you, you already said, you know, some of what I was going to say in response. Um, and which is that, yeah, so the campus as a battleground is being lost when instead of actually confronting the campus police and the cops on campus, the students are being told not, you know, they're being prohibited. They can't even say anything, right? So even the possibility of confrontation has been taken away. And I think that's, you know, um, again, a sign of, um, you know, of, of, of these, it's not so much a shift because it, that, that modality of criminalization has been around for, for such a long time. But um, so, but I do think if you ask about the university, then um, I think we, we, we also need to, to a shift in our political imagination in terms of how we can make the university serve to uh, the causes, in the, you know, I, I don't think we can expect the university to remain uh, a space where most of the work can be done. Um, you know, as 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 you were talking about at the beginning, we 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 need uh, we need other spaces, and we need to gather resources of the university to bring to other places to do to do the political work, like all the you know the the post enlightenment institutions. This one is is also compromised. And I don't know if beyond hope. I hope not, but I don't know. I'm not very optimistic. But but the but uh, Hiba's uh, question about it is a excuse me it is a it is a predicament, isn't it? And I think it is the predicament of of the expo on the one hand the demand for for exposing and exhibiting the wound. Um, and, and then, so as you you provide evidence of of a right being violated or of violence being done, and at the same time, the body that is exhibiting this wound is never uh, the person. <laughs> that person is never encountered as a subject of rights anyway. Um, so that's I think that's the predicament from which we have to begin to think because we we, we still think that okay. It is dehumanizing. So if only, if only we were recognized as humans, if only they would ever not not shoot on sight, um, sight, sight, assuming that that we are criminals, whether criminals as terrorists or drug dealers, right? If, if we keep this and 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 never, it, it will never happen because the very the 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 whole the whole formation is is built and supported by by the fact that that we are not human, that no matter how many evidence you show, it's never going to be taken as evidence, right? It's not even evidence. And I think, um, and I know that that doesn't, um, doesn't give, it doesn't give a way out in terms of how do we address what's happening now, but I think it gives a way towards designing something else. And, and I'm so afraid that the designing something else would that something else would basically be structures for enabling the continuation, both physical and intellectual and spiritual, uh, in spite of the state, in spite of the institutions. Um, so I think that's where I that's what I get, at, you know, as I think about the situation in, in Gaza and Palestine now, and the situation in Haiti 
right now in the situation in Sudan and the situation in the neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro, which, uh, you know, all those, those places in different ways, more or less, which are, sometimes are visible, many times are not visible, but where this ongoing deployment of total violence, it's always there, whether it's low intensity or high intensity, it's been there for, for such a long time. So to me, when I, when I say we have to, the thinking has to begin with violence, it's there where, you know, it's there in, in that moment, which is in the moment of the impossibility, the moment where every, every tool that we have at our disposal is absolutely useless. Um, and, um, yeah, anyway, so, <laughs> I'll thank clap. you. Atia, please. Um, thank you so much, Sandy, Alessandro, and Denise for your talks. And, you know, it's like almost painful to have to engage the slow temporality of academic work in this context of, uh, a crisis. And, and so I was really appreciative of this model that your work offers of, practicing and ethics of engagement. Um, I'm going to try and maybe put both my questions together in the interest of time. Um, it, it, Sandy, Alessandro, I'm really struck by how in your work um, in the in the refugee camp, the first kind of battleground is a battleground of language. And you confront that in your work in, in this, you know, in this word of um, the uh, permanent temporary this this contradictory word, um, but then it was also interesting in 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 these other ways that uh, meaning is transformed that that you brought up in the talk when when you presented the work today. You know the the context, the idea of a neighbor. What is that? All of the public, private, all of these things change meaning first in the refugee camp. So it almost seems like a machine for altering meaning. But what sort of interesting about it, I think, in in your work is this kind of dialectical mode that you have recognized by which the colonial mode itself operates, which is that it speaks one language, but it means another. And it is really the position of the subaltern that recognizes that that that, that use of language, you know, that, that kind of um, turn of phrase. And so it speaks to two different, um, to, to, it speaks in two voices at the same time. And so I, you know, it made me think about the kind of paradoxical positionality from which you yourselves had to develop a kind of language with which to practice architectural production, you know, with which to create the idea, craft a practice itself. And I was, and, and you know, looking at your work, I was imagining what kinds of constraints you may have had to confront to shape this kind of iterative, recursive model of making an architectural practice, a decolonial practice that you have crafted in what I would, you know, call a kind of broken infrastructure of world, world building. Um, and so I, my question is, you know, how, how does one in this context of being compelled almost produce a kind of decolonial practice from within a colonial epistemology? And so, you know, a little bit to connect it to the question I had for Denise, which is also a question of how to craft a practice. Um, again, here, you know, the, when you talk about the street and in some of your other work, you've talked about the house, they have these multiple meanings, um, a meaning of it, it's, you know, an economic object, it's a political object, it's a symbolic object. And, and it was, it really struck me today how the street itself occupies these uh, meanings that confront each other. Um, and so it, it feels to me that in your critique, you are describing this modern political subject, but in your artwork, you are trying to put that subject into crisis. And so, you know, the, the kind of content of my question is about crafting a practice that can put this space into crisis or put this, um, Con condition of non-coincidental needs that function to create a kind of um, subject to which to which the um, how, how did what was the phrase you used you, you it, that is subject to criminalization but it, it this kind of regime of natural law does not extend to them it, it seems to me that in your art practice particularly 
uh, you really, especially with that word confrontation, you want to put it into crisis. And so particularly because, you know, we're sitting in here a space in, in the kind of pedagogical context of uh, where students are really trying to craft that kind of practice. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, let me begin with uh, with saying that indeed, maybe the first realization that we had coming in Palestine and, and not having skills to do so is that we realized that we have been trained in a colonial universities and structures, right? And, and the dictionary that we were taught were a dictionary that is representing one frame, you know, right? Right. In, in some way, I also realized at a certain point that I myself, I mean, we speak about ourselves as decolonial, I mean, bodies that have been oppressed. Yet, I think that the moment that I was sent to study architecture in Italy, the idea was that I go study modern architecture and return back to civilize my community, right? So in, in that sense, the moment that we architects think that we are the civilizers of the world, by doing so, we are actually supporting colonization. So in that sense, we should absolutely create a new language for us to be able to, to decolonize. And first of all, also to realize and not to accept the fact that if we are uh, uh, bodies that have been raised uh, as as uh, colonized people that we have not that our mind has not been uh, actually in some way uh, colonized and 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 uh, so I think decolonizing the mind is the first act in order to decolonize architecture or decolonize anything else. So we realize that we the the the, the dictionary of architecture that we were bringing with us or that we studied and that is in our mind need first of all to be uh, to be thought radically all all the major foundations through which we studied architecture was extremely to be questioned in order for us to be able to uh, think decolonizing architecture. And suddenly only the moment that we you begin not to take these words by granted and not to define it as, as they taught you that you should define it, it is these are the first foundation to begin to decolonize architecture. The moment that you begin to do so, you don't accept anymore to do architecture the way you do it normally. And, and in some ways so strange, but projects comes alone in that sense. Projects comes as consequences. The moment that you begin to decolonize your mind, decolonize your vocabulary, decolonize your dictionary and decolonize the words that you think what they mean because if we think that we know what private mean what public mean and we apply this to all the situation then this is a very colonial attitude a very colonial uh, architecture right so in some way i think there was no other i would argue that there was no other way at, in order to think decolonizing architecture if not by rethinking these vocabularies that are the foundation of that same architecture. Denise. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Tania, for, the, for your question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you kind of described what, um, what I do. <laughs> um, so maybe I can, I can just say, um, um, well, how, um, I don't even know how to say it because it's the simple question, but it's it's not because it's it's just by by doing. But but for me, it's crucial. Though, okay, so I can I can I can say something that makes sense by saying that I am I am what I'm, I'm interested in. You know, in um, at the same time that I that uh, I'm talking about rivalry and and uh, and the importance of taking taking the streets again. As as this site for uh, for confrontation, right? For staging confrontations with the authoritarian aspect of the liberal state, which is always there. Um, we usually, you know, we tend to identify it only with fascism, but fascism is not separate. It's there. It is there in the colonial, you know, in, in the in, in in the deployment of coloniality like Israel's now, but it's there here in the U.S. operating in different ways and everywhere. So. Once, once we 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 assume accept that that authority is there, 
Um, then before, before it, um, the, the, the most appropriate uh, political response is, is, is rebellion. Uh, right, but then, but also, if we think of this, the, the epistemic and onto epistemological enclosures that are the tools we have, like as Sandy was saying, the terms, the concepts we use, then a, 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 a confrontational practice is one of undermining them, however it's possible. So one of the things that I, I usually do is to play with the different meanings of the words, as you were saying. I love and use and usually usually I'm interested in the most archaic, the one that is not used because usually that one holds something that cannot be immediately captured within you know in the in the current grammar and then and that can be you know deployed in in uh, I think I'm going back to give us question about refusal right because it is it is the refusal to to to. It is not the refusal, not only the refusal as no, I'm not going to go there only, but also refusal in, 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 in standing the stage and, and refusing to perform that, what is expected, uh, you know. And, these, and those are metaphors, but, uh, but I think at the same time, they, they hold some, something that we can take to, to the academic practice itself. Um, and, and then also towards, you know, undermining some, certain uh, separations, such as the one between, uh, you know, the artwork and the, and, and, and the text. I, I was open, uh, opening an exhibition like last month, and then somebody, we, we were doing a conversation with Arjuna and myself, whatever, and we were talking about the film, and then somebody in the audience asked if we had a book that could they could read because we were talking about all those things. So maybe you have a book and like, we can't possibly have a book. That book would have a thousand pages or maybe a million pages. What the film allows us to bring can never be written. And, and this is a good thing, right? Um, that, that they can be there at the same time and at the same time be separate. But I, yeah, um, I think that this is a, an inadequate answer, but... <laughs> And, and maybe if I may add very quickly and in, indeed to Denise is that I think that we we should both undermine certain concepts, but also actually add to a, a very, for example, you know, working in a place like Palestine, uh, verbs like neighboring and hosting has a complete different meaning. They are still mm -hmm. what constitutes society, right? It's not the same mm -hmm. in New York. It is not the same in Stockholm, right? I mean, in societies where modernity has been the base and individualism has been the base, concepts like neighboring and hosting are not anymore valuable in some way or even have almost no meaning and no thoughts in building the city. While in a place like Palestine, you cannot think the city without thinking these two um, practices, right? So it's also extremely important to add and think the cities departuring from uh, these practices. And, and by doing so, we are actually thinking decolonial de uh, in, in that sense. Maybe. This is a, a good moment to, to open it up to the audience. I also wanted to, to ask you if you have questions for each other, um, please please let us know as well. Um, any questions from the audience? Please, yeah. It seems to me, I remember that I sat in this auditorium many, many years ago, but once I was here, after the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Of, of and there was discussion about that. And there was also a conference here on manifestos during the Occupy movement. And it seems that we're, we have reruns of the same issues, which are now being magnified in which, <clears throat> as a Chinese person um, who studied here, I remember the only course that I took on Chinese architecture was with Klaus Herdig. And talking about, I appreciate your comments that we've all been colonized. When I, when I was at Tsinghua University teaching there, I discovered that its foundations were the Beaux-Arts. 
And this, this, this colonial model is just prevalent. It's been going on for so long. But interestingly, the Middle Eastern uh, leaders were just in Beijing with Xi Jinping, in which Xi Jinping banned skyscrapers. So then we're thinking about like what uh, Secretary of State Blinken said, you know, this Ukrainian Israeli conflict is really all about going against China. Well, trying to ban skyscrapers, even if Ukraine and the Palestine is rebuilt, what is it gonna be rebuilt? Mark Taylor here wrote the book, Disfiguring, and this is what we're talking about, the disfiguring and what Edward Said, who was a professor here when I taught here, about orientalizing and how we view other people's bodies, including women and children. But we seem to be recycling the same old issues and we can't get out of this Western versus everybody else, Judeo-Christian canonicity. And I was just with Nadir Tarani, who was at Cooper Union, who ran into problems because he was Iranian, but also he tried to expand the analysis uh, uh, research studies on what buildings to look at. And we have this complete orientalizing Occupy 9-11 war on terrorism and keep that going. Can you please respond? <laughs> Maybe I, I can very quickly try to respond. You know, I still remember when uh, when we were in negotiation with, at that point, it was actually the government of Hamas that we were in negotiation with for the rebuilding of the neighborhood in Gaza. And, you know, I still remember they showed me uh, images of Le Corbusier and the towers that Le Corbusier was doing. And they were saying, this is the only, I mean, we should absolutely only build in this way because this is the only sustainable way that we can build in Gaza. Well, if you move around in Gaza and see how people have the ability to build together among themselves, the sustainability they created, if they have to, add a wall, they negotiate with the neighborhood that wall. If they have to open a window, that window is negotiated with the neighborhood. If they have to do a, a square in the neighborhood, it is collectively thought about and negotiated. And yet the only model they had in mind is that modern model that separates everything, that separates the street from uh, the private, from the public. And that has nothing to do with Gaza. Yes, because we are all colonized. We think that the only people we can refer to is what we are having in the universities, departuring from the most colonial architect, which is Le Corbusier, right? So, and we are still teaching him in our universities, right? So how can we even speak about decolonization today? I would say, how can we even dare to speak about decolonization today in Western institutions? Yes. Uh, I can I can just just add um, another example um, of you know why why we keep going back to the same place because we keep digging the same thing right we keep <laughs> digging ourselves so um, I was reading a very interesting article by a, a legal a critical legal scholar um, a black critical legal scholar young of a new generation. And, and they make a, a very compelling argument about how it's, we should expand uh, how Europe and the, you know, the former colonizers should have an expanded uh, definition of their borders so as to include the former colonized who are now migrating to Europe in search of a, for a better life. And, um, and then the arguments made that this should be so because, because they are interconnected. They have been interconnected you know, for hundreds of years now. So why somebody from, I don't know, Angola is not immediately as taken as um, a citizen of, of, uh, of Portugal. And they define it in terms of, of political equality. And I'm reading, it's beautifully written, like, you know, a law article can be uh, very well organized and very nicely written. And, but, but like expanding the borders, right? So 
of the nation state beyond the nation state, but creating another figure like the nation state to bring together and then apart. It's like, but but then you are going to create another exclusion. No? So the solution for what to look at what's happening to you know migrants now, just in terms of expanding the borders for the of include for including and expanding political equality is is uh, is that endless hole out of which, you know, and then when when we look at what has happened, for instance, in Europe, uh, with this, that, the so-called refugee crisis, is that Europe did not respond through saying, you know, excluding, just through excluding, but actually through criminalizing and creating fortress Europe to protect its borders, right? There is something else that is going on. The deployment of authority, not, uh, uh, you know, a state, something about Inequality. But anyway, so the point is, we can't make those 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 tools do work that they're not supposed to. And many times, every time we try, we end up creating another, yet another, another, and another dimension of of uh, of subjugation. So um, I don't know. Maybe with the <laughs> with the the, the designs, <laughs> we should let go also of you know of the the raw materials and the, the tools. So that that exercise that I shared with you was precisely that, just opening up a very little thing so as to see, okay, so this is the thing that's operating. And now how do we get, how do we avoid bringing it back into a critique and then recreating the same, you know, creating the same situation again and again. But, uh. Any other questions from the audience? No. Oh, sorry, I'm Paul. Um, thank you, Sandy, Alessandro, and Denise. I um, first of all really appreciated um, the engagement with this discussion of refusal, and I'm very interested in the relationship between uh, practices of refusal and what practices of refusal in architecture might entail, and also the relationship between refusal and liberation. I can I can say because my my answer is 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 um, I think it's short. Uh, well, okay, so thank you thank you for the discussion because this question is never asked as straightforwardly as as you just did, and uh, but it is always there, right? And I think that that it may be um, that that refusal is also it it, it is also refusal of um yeah of of uh, maybe maybe i shouldn't say it's a refusal but it is a, an acknowledgement of the limits of liberation which in a way um you know works in the same way as i was mentioning now the idea of political uh, equality within borders right um so and that because because liberation uh you know it signals it signals the occupation of a certain position, which is only made of, has only been made available due to a certain structure of epistemic, colonial, uh, you know, political, uh, symbolic, symbolic vi violence that is modern thinking. So, um, but but more importantly, um, maybe so as not to throw the, the 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 bath and the water and the baby, maybe we can think of. <laughs> Of, of refusal as the everyday practice, as an everyday practice that opens up some space for, for breathing, let's call it liberation, some collective space for, for liberation. Um, so, because, because the idea of liberation, you know, you're always postponing, right? It's, you know, it's always for, for some other time or some, some other moment. And there is so much sacrifice that it's involved in, you know, in that project. In the meantime, um, yeah. In the meantime, we we sh we should make sure that those who are fighting for liberation stay alive to do so. So we need to create space for breathing, for existing. Uh, and when I say breathing, is you know, it's beyond just breathing, for existing. Um, so I think practices of refusal. If you think of refusal to die, refusal to comply, um, refusal to obey, 
um, uh, have, you know, in my view, have to do with that, with the, what happens in the meantime before liberation. Yeah, and maybe in, in that sense, I will tell you what my body and mind lately, especially, you know, after living in Palestine and then when we moved to uh, Europe and in somehow maybe because I, we began uh, in, in Palestine, we began a process of mind decolonization, right? So returning back then to Europe, I realized that, for example, my first refusal was to be included. I mean, if there is a world that I hate in Western institutions is inclusion, <laughs> because be including you means that you are giving, you are legitimizing mm -hmm. that one frame, right? So for me, that the, is, is the refuse to begin with, because each one of us has to refuse what he understand in order to build something else, right? So now I am, people are afraid around me when they say we would like to include you because because I, I am like, you know, I can I can really jump on, on them because it's not, you cannot include me always. And indeed in some way, one of the projects that we created and uh, that we did not speak about is the living room project where we demand, absolutely demand to be both host and guest. And the problem with Western institutions is that they always want to host us. And I have no problem with being hosted, but hosting means power. Hosting means maintaining the control. And if they don't know how to be guests, because guests means that you have to trust others, that you have to trust what they, how they seat you, what they feed you. And for a while, you should lose control. And I think for me, for example, one way that I liberated myself, at least within the spaces where I begin to live in Europe, is to demand what I call my right to be a host, right? So in and and to reject and refuse to be included. And indeed, you know, always I am asking what who is hosting me? It becomes a extremely important question. So in some way, I think we should choose our battles and we should undermine. For me, the liberation is also very, very clearly is to undermine the one and only one Western dominant universal you know it's not universal it's western but they make it universal so they can include all of us and i think this is a major refusal at this point of history it's clear to me that that is what we need to refuse from other pos from our position where we are standing in this moment this is where we we, we can support a place like gaza by refusing only to be guests we need to host and they should accept to be hosted in other people's narration. This is the only way that we began to crack the system and we began to have a moment of liberation. I think, oh, there's one more question, yeah, Mahdi. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just thinking a bit about the question of refusal again, and you mentioned the question, or you mentioned refusal to obey and also refusal to be included. Um, and I'm thinking a bit about refusal in the context of a university, simply put, because we are here right now. <laughs> um, um, and I, I totally agree with the idea that there are battles outside of here that seem to be a lot more significant or at least seem to be places where things could actually move. Uh, but in the context of this university, um, I'm thinking I'm thinking of the hospitals of Gaza right now. So I'm thinking of uh, the schools, the hospitals, the shelters uh, that are being bombed by Israel. And I'm thinking of the people in those buildings um, managing to stay alive, managing to keep each other alive. Um, and the whole thing is extremely architectural. Um, and I, I, in my process of anger and mourning, I, I find it very difficult to understand how, um, how any of us can talk about anything but this sort of violent uh, manifestation of colonial power happening inside those buildings. And so I'm thinking a bit of refusal to speak about anything else but this, right? Um, and if if you could 
both comment on this. And again, this isn't a critique of anyone here. I think it's something we're all thinking about. And so I'm I'm curious about ways in which you're confronting that thought and that dilemma. Thank you. You know, I can't, I don't have an answer because it has been, I have to say, we, we have been three weeks that we are debating and, and each time we have an invitation, it's becoming really hard. Each time we have an invitation, we are, should we refuse or should we go? This is, this is the first thing. Is there even space to speak uh, beyond what is going in Gaza right now? And I have to admit that in our case, we stayed for the first two weeks, we shut down ourselves completely. And we were in front of the screens, unable to do anything else if not being, it, it feels like another time where we are back in a lockdown, right? And at a certain point, we uh, decided to go for uh, Lund University, a place where I feel home and I feel a little bit protected. And we both of us had a lecture and we decided to go there. And in some way, you know, I have been in Lund University for the past five years and I have never felt that the students and the faculties has such uh high attention to what we are talking about like in this period so i mean i am i'm a little bit thinking should we still be each one doing his own battle i mean also to think about you know we were while we were refusing colombia and in in that sense you know we have been in contact with so many people while we are refusing we are also building a movement of uh, you know we are building upon the architects and and uh, planners against um, apartheid in order to build a larger movements of architects for us to think decolonization together and this is both Actually, in some way, I think that we have, because we are not under the, uh, the, the, the bombardment in this moment, we need to do our task. We need to begin to undermine the places that are still in first place, giving legitimacy to continue bombarding Gaza. This is what we can do. This is, you know, we have to admit that we got inside our houses, close our door and sleep safely in the night. And if we are doing so, we have a task. We have a task to begin to actually hold accountable all the architects, each one in his own field. In our field, held architects and planners accountable if they dare to build in a colonial situation. I mean, this is this is what we can do. This is what we know how to do. And and you know, it's it's not that I am very sure of this. I am, I mean, I am not sure even if us being here is still for whatever we are talking about, how strong we are talking about, how radical we are talking about, if we are only still giving legitimacy to Columbia University, I would be extremely um troubled with that, right? So in, in that sense, it's not, it's not I that I have an answer. We we have been, uh, you know, I mean, I have even been speaking with my family and they say, no, I mean, we should, we know that the, the space to speak will be closing very, very, very soon. This might be our last lecture in a place like the USA, right? But in some way, I think we still maybe need to speak or find our autonomous spaces to speak and use this moment to build that energy in order for us to create autonomous spaces from where we can undermine that one universal uh, uh, narration of, of who we are and build our own vocabulary and, and maybe encourage others to build their own vocabulary in this idea of the world, having so many narration where we will meet at the threshold rather than all of us meeting inside one Western uh, sort of frame. Maybe I, I would just like to... Um to share what I also personally um, learned in refugee camps about uh, refusal. Um, to me, um, the most important uh, political lesson um, working um, uh, in refugee camps, um, it was how refugees for uh, more than seven decades, Palestinian refugees have refused 
to normalize um, their conditions of um, of refugees because you know the pressure um, was always to uh, to abandon you know the the idea of return to abandon you know the idea of um, uh, seek justice. Um, for me, the the great uh, political lesson that actually is materialized in the architecture in the camp um, is um, uh, is refusing, you know, to uh, normalize an unjust present. Um, personally, this was the most uh, important lesson that I've learned, and I always take it with me uh, of of refusing to. Uh, to normalize um, as it is, you know, in this very time um, that what we are witnessing is normal, you know, that can be acceptable. Um, I refuse that, you know, I simply refuse that. And um, in the camp, I think that is so inscribed in the space itself also to uh, to understand that how materiality this is expressed by you know uh, questions that from the beginning emerge if um, you should build after some years in exile you know a roof so that uh, single elements in the camp become so politically loaded because if you build a roof means that you accept the fact that you have been expelled and you're gonna stay there um, opening a door all these kind of very simple um, architectural elements in refugee camps, they have a deep uh, political uh, meanings. Um, and that to me has been always uh, a very important lesson um, that uh, I take it with me every time that apparently we move you know, in the spaces of the city, thinking that this is, these are normal. So that idea of, of refusing uh, and normality, I think it's a great political lesson. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is uh, yeah your question and how how do we how do we I think well I'm translating your your question as how do we do what we do under under such conditions. Um, I think my answer is you 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 do it. Um, it's impossible. It's it's uh, unbelievable that you are doing that to work the work we we are doing now it's, uh, and I'm and I, I find myself doing now this is the the teacher in me that says okay we we, we do however the, it, it will be it's not going to be the the conversation that we would have had had what's happening not being happening uh, and yet we, we we do it and um, and I say that I I belong to uh, the generation, um, both in, Bra in Brazil and in the US, to the generation that saw the arrival of cocaine and and guns in uh, in the in the inner cities and in the, in the housing projects. So when I was um, uh, 13, 14, 15, I started seeing the, my my classmates' bodies on the streets killed killed by the killed by the police and 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 you know and living under 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 policing um all the time and to me this is uh, this is the the drive what drives my my writing and I, I like to say that i belong to my generation the only difference is that i you know i i rebel in 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 the intellectual world but but more importantly um of course, this this moment uh, right now, we we may not be doing the work, you know, thinking more in terms of 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 the academic work we do. But at some point, at some point, something will come out. I remember, I have this piece, Nobody's, which um, it is it is about something that happened that I I never wrote, I never written an academic piece about it, but then I wrote that piece. Only so something happened in my neighborhood in in Rio de Janeiro in 2007. Um, the what the kids who work for the drug dealers they let the police come in and then the the chief killed uh, three of them. Uh, they were eight between eight and ten year old, 
And then the police came at night to try to retrieve the bodies. And I was home. Um, I was already living in the US, outside of Brazil, but I was home. And and then for like four hours, I just I just heard the like the they use automatic weapons, right? So just this. And I, I just felt like I want to go underground because I don't know how. And then also not understanding how my parents and, and the, our neighbors and my family, how they live in that. Because I've been living outside of that, of Brazil for 30 years. So, and, um, and then, and then the, and the, the feeling that it should not be happening, it should not, it, like nobody should go through it. That was 2007, um, 2009, uh, Israel attacks Gaza. And we were watching on TV all these, you know, all the, you know, the bombs, the, the missiles. And I'm, and I just, and I was just think, oh my God, how it feels like when all the sides, everything's shooting at you and there is no place to go. And so I wrote the, the, the piece that became the article, Nobodies. And, and I only, I was only, and it is about what happened in 2007. I don't mention it in the piece. I do, I have a, this, you know, en passant, mentioned to of to to Gaza, but still it's all there in that piece. It took me two years to three years to to be able to write that out of my system. So and then but I write that out of my out of my system, not only in, in this exercise, right? So but also towards for so it becomes something that others can use to for thinking other circumstances and not only um not only that specific moment. So yeah, so there is, is it is it is an intense, impossible moment. And um I don't know, maybe this is very <laughs> so personal, but to me it translates into uh that impossibility becomes the becomes almost an obligation uh to do something which is the thing that I know how to do. So as you know, whatever it is, uh, the article, the film, whatever it is, becomes available to somebody else for doing some some other some other work. Um, but maybe this is a, this is more of an, ori an orientation than well, what it is. But but the key to me that is the refusal to to comply and to to silence or 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 also the, the refusal to to say that it is what it is, right? Uh, that is also going back to the question of visibility. How do you how do you write about the things that are happening in such a way as not to become, uh, you know, evidence or a native informant and then reproduce the same system of knowledge, whatever. Um, anyway, let us so just to the work. <laughs> let us end on that note. I think. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for an important uh, conversation. Um, I want to, to mention um, also that our next affirmation will not be until two months uh, from now, January um, 22. We will talk about climate regimes with, with Samia Hani, um, Rob Nixon, with a response by, by Reinhold Martin and, and Keller Easterling. Um, I want to thank uh, Alessandro, Denise and Sandy and Hiba and Dia um, for this conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you all for not refusing. Yes. Okay. Sign the sign sign the architects and planners against apartheid. If you're here, I guess you you ac accept the fact that we at least have to maintain academic freedom, protect our spaces, keep the battlefield alive, and at the least call for ceasefire and stop of violence. Please, thank you.